We're going to talk about uh, and begin the launch of the public consultation for the principles for responsible banking. And to kick it off, um, I would like to welcome on stage Brian Kaplan, the editor of The Banker, a publication of the Financial Times. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great pleasure to be at the UNFI Global Roundtable. Um, as was said, I'm the editor of the Banker Magazine, part of the FT Group. Uh, for those of you who know the magazine, uh, you know we have this great history. We've been in business since 1926, so we've seen most things, and we like to keep on top of the challenges facing both the planet and the financial industry. And of course, climate change is one of those. And so we have done quite a lot of editorial work around these kinds of issues, and indeed, not just only about how uh, banks need to uh, reorganize to, to be better aligned with, with uh, and the fight against climate change, but also the very interesting and important uh, threat that climate change uh, could make to the financial system if we don't get on top of it. <laughs> I think it's very uh, apposite, as has been said, to be in Paris. It's always great to come to Paris, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, who, who turns down a trip to Paris, <laughs> even if the weather's not quite what it should be yet? But of course, it is the, uh, the city of climate change, uh, which has really awakened, I think, everybody in, 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 on the globe, especially in the business community, about what needs to be done. And I think we shouldn't be discouraged, you know, because one president from one country has decided to opt out. Because, uh, no, seriously, folks, I mean, it's, it's only one president from one country for one particular time, you know, and, and there's plenty of time to get America back on board. And meanwhile, we're all got to be involved in this uh, important issue in any case. So don't be discouraged by that. Of course, the other thing uh, that, that banks have been dealing with over the last few years. Uh, 2018 marked 10 years since the financial crisis. And uh, obviously it was a time of very bad uh, reput rep reputational damage to the banking industry. And we've seen a massive uh, re-regulation of the banking sector over that time. But what I think is important about what we're doing today is it's all very fine to re-regulate banking, and we can say now banks are in a much better place than they used to be, they're much better managed, they're much better regulated, they're much better governed, they're much safer. <laughs> but is that just what we want to do? Don't we also want to be actually admired for what we're doing, for what we're contributing to the economy, rather than just tolerate it? And the way I see it, uh, the principles of responsible banking uh, are a way of getting the financial industry to be a leader in the fight against climate change and not just being sort of pulled along uh, under protest. So very pleased to be here. Now I want to uh, hand over, we're gonna have a leaders dialogue now on the role of banking. And I'd like to invite uh, Brandy McHale, who's the director of Corporate Citizenship City and president of the City Foundation to moderate that. So please give Brandy a big warm welcome, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'd actually like to invite up my two panelists to please join me, Elliot and Martin. We have a short amount of time, so we want to... Okay, so a wonderful start to the day. And we're at an, a very exciting um, inflection point where we really need to continue to both continue the dialogue on the why this is so important, but I think even more so the how. And how do we 
take this move from, from continuing to communicate a sense of urgency to show how this can be done and be done both in a sustainable way in terms of a healthy planet and achieving the prosperity goals that we want, but also in a sustainable way for our own companies and private sector institutions. Um, Elliot Harris is the UN Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General. And Martin Skenke is the chair for the Principles for Responsible Investment. And so I want to um, use our little bit of time to hear some of their reflections and get some guidance from them as we kick off the discussion. So let me begin with you, Elliot, and start with the big picture. Um, to reiterate what we've heard this morning, you know, for, future, for current and future generations to enjoy sustainable prosperity and a healthy planet, um, we know that we need to make changes to our economies and in turn our society. So let's talk a little bit from your perspective. Why do we need the global banking industry to help really to lead on these issues? Thank you very much, Brandy, and good morning to everyone. As you said, just in introducing this particular topic, uh, what we are trying to achieve through the sustainable development agenda is a, a complete change in the way we organize and run our lives. You know, it's, it's a question of moving towards in basic summary, sustainable patterns of consumption and production. And we have a lot to change the way we manage our, our resource use, our energy use, the way we make our investment decisions and so on. Now, the reason I see banks as being very important in this context is because most people, it is through banks that they interact with finance. Most people don't have direct dealings with asset managers or institutional investors. And banks, in fact, provide a lot of the finance for our daily lives. They, they finance the operations of enterprises, they finance consumer durables, and so on and so forth. Now, they can either provide money to the demand that people have, or they can help to influence the way in which people think about that demand by changing the incentives, changing the cost structures, making available finance, or withdrawing the availability of that finance. And because the banks are, in essence, the lifeblood of the financial system as it interacts with, with real people, their role is particularly important. The decisions that banks make and the way in which they position themselves with regard to sustainability is something that every individual will notice very directly. And so banks do have the ability to accelerate the transition simply by their choices and by the way in which they position themselves in financing economic and social activity. So, Martin, let, let's continue this thread for a moment, and I want to talk to you from the investor shareholder perspective. Um, so, clearly, we let's say we have consensus that it's important for banks to define a clear purpose for themselves and align with society's goals. So, what does this mean for the financial balance sheet? Does it mean that there's always a financial trade off for the investor in order to do this? No, uh, absolutely not. And I think uh, my good friend and uh, fellow board member at the PRI Hero, Ms. Zuni, said it very eloquently uh, just before this session. Uh, I don't think you can have a sustainable business model in a world that's not sustainable. So I think the perspective that, that he drew up, I think, is exactly the right one. It has to do with uh, the fact that large, diversified institutional owners, they have a stake in the economy as a whole and also that they have a long time horizon for their investments. And so they should care about these risks that may not be material in the very short term, but that will have a material impact on risk and return over the longer term. So I think looking at this from the side of investors, uh, we definitely welcome this initiative. It is uh, extraordinarily timely and useful. Uh, I think it has this, uh, let's call it indirect benefit because it complements the efforts of investors, but also a direct benefit to investors because um, for better or worse, um, capitalization of financial sector is now about 25% of the total stock market capitalization. Uh, we could discuss in a separate event whether that is a sign of a healthy uh, economy, but that's what it is. Um, so it means that for the typical investor actually investments in the financial industry itself is a large part of their investments. And so making sure that those investments are sustainable and, and that these investments can deliver uh, healthy financial returns over a long uh, time horizon is actually essential uh, to investors. So one of the aspects of the banking principles that makes them unique 
is that they're voluntary. So we're not, financial institutions are not required at this point to do this. Um, and we know that typically the, the being in the business of requiring banks to do something falls under the purview of governments and, and public sector regulators. So how do you see, if you had a, a crystal ball and could predict what might happen as a result of the banking principles and these voluntary principles, what's the relationship between signing on to these set of principles, building momentum, and then how does regulation play into this? Well, one could look at regulation first as saying, let's um, avert harm. Let's make sure that we have a minimum set of good practices. And the regulation sets the basic minimum of what everybody has to do, but it doesn't say how far one can go. And what I think we'll see happening here is that um, through the respecting of these principles, banks will be going beyond what the regulations require them to do and moving closer and closer towards the objective of sustainability. And in fact, you'll find that the regulation will be falling behind, if you will, the good banking practice. It won't be up to the standard of good banking practice. Now, we've seen that happen in, in several cases where the regulation has had to catch up with effective practice. And uh, one case that I'd like to cite here is with uh, Colombia, for example, where the bankers came up with their own green protocol and then had to discuss with the regulators how regulation had to change. But on the other hand, the regulation itself can take a proactive role in shaping the way in which uh, practice happens on, 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 on markets. And we have examples of that from Bangladesh and China, for example, where very innovative regulation in, in setting up green credit guidelines or, or particular ways in which um, credit quotas are set for green lending, where that drives innovation in the, in the banking practices. And so we can have both sides of the equation moving towards greater sustainability. But I think what is really important here is that there be a constant and open dialogue between banks and their regulators, just as we see in other parts of the financial sector. Martin, do you want to add anything there? Uh, yeah, we need both. Uh, but we have to realize that financial regulation is incredibly important, but the regulatory perspective is always about avoiding the very worst outcomes. It's about avoiding the disasters, the, the huge meltdowns. Uh, the regulatory perspective is not and shouldn't be and will never be about uh, exploiting the, all of those opportunities that are there, for instance, in the transition to a low carbon economy, uh, strengthening uh, investment processes, making sure that you have better capital allocation, uh, that you understand the challenges, sustainability of business models in the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, this was, you know, the topic of uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures and talking about stress testing of business models. Uh, so I think uh, you know, the focus on sustainability to me is really about also a focus on opportunities, on business opportunities and the regulatory perspective will never provide that. It will provide a backstop against the very worst outcomes and we need that. Uh, but this is also about having a framework that can uh, make investors understand how they can uh, exploit all of the business opportunities in the tr uh, transition to a more sustainable economy. Great, thank you. So Ali, you, you started to raise some specific examples and I think one of our objectives over the next two days is to move from the theory to the practice, from the theoretical to the practical. So can you, um, or uh, either of you, if you wanna also jump in, Martin, cite some examples um, of the principles in action that you think are a model for others um, and to remind us that we're actually not starting from the, the very, very beginning state. Many of us have been engaged in this work and what are some things that you, you were most optimistic about? Well, indeed, there are quite a few examples, um, and some of these date back um, a few years now. Um, one that comes to mind is the, the banker's oath in the Netherlands, which is a, a mandatory mechanism that requires ethical conduct and, and integrity principles in the conduct of professional activities among the banks. And that's linked to a social charter that sets out very clearly that banks have a social responsibility. Now, that was back in 2013 and renewed in 2015, so it, it predates these. We've had the voluntary green protocol of the Brazilian Bankers Association, again, which brings together the banks um, taking the initiative in making sure they have a system-wide sense of what their socio-environmental exposure and risks might be. And we have the French Bankers Association, one, one can refer to them as well, setting up guidelines and setting out the linkages between banks and climate um, action 
and making it clear and, and, and helping the banks to understand how they can seek financing solutions for energy efficiency that are consistent with this kind of, of an approach. So we have quite a few examples of innovations happening driven by the banking sector itself, even before these principles have been worked out. So I, I know we're almost out of time, but I, I have to actually um, make sure we leave a moment, Martin. I want to ask you for some words of wisdom, actually, because the banking principles have been informed in large part by the principles on responsible investment. Um, are there any lessons learned or words of, of wisdom that you can share based on your experience with the PRI? I'm not sure how wise these words will be, but um, one experience I think that uh, the, the founders of these principles will have to deal with is the issue of accountability. Um, and I think uh, once you launch these principles and people start signing up, you create an expectation that this should lead to real change. And if you're successful, which I'm sure you will be, you'll be signing up a lot of banks and then suddenly some banks will be saying, well, actually I know that you know, my, my competitor across the street has signed up, but I know that they're not doing anything. So how can, uh, you know, how can we be in the same organization? And they're just free riding. On, on this initiative. And so the UN Global Compact has had this discussion, the PRI has had this discussion about how do you ensure accountability, how do you ensure minimum standards, what does it mean to be a signatory, what kind of obligation does it entail. So I think you'll be having those discussions very soon, and especially if you're successful, which I'm sure you will be. Uh, and so I think uh, that is a discussion which is very useful to address head on very early. I, it is much tougher to do that uh, once you've uh, moved down a few years and you've signed up lots of banks and then you're starting to think, well, hmm, should really these uh, banks be a part of this initiative? So I, you know, these are some difficult decisions, but uh, it, it will be easier to address those if you address that uh, at the start of the initiative. Elliot, let me ask, any, any guidance, words of wisdom, things that you think we should be keep, keeping top of mind? Well, I think one thing that strikes me in these discussions is that this uh, question of the trade-off between prof profitability and sustainability, the trade-off is perhaps a lot less important than one thinks on the surface. When you scratch a little bit down, you find that it is entirely possible to be sustainable and still be highly profitable. And, and the more we see uh, financial sector players engaging in a sustainable uh, business model, the clearer that will be. I think the other thing that uh, strikes me from the experience over the last few years is that we see more and more that the markets can actually lead policy and lead it in the right direction. And having um, financial sector players sign on to the principles of sustainability in a broad sense helps to ensure that the ways in which markets lead policy are acceptable and are actually the types of outcomes that we want to have. So I'd encourage us all to continue to work in that sphere and, we, and we'll see positive results coming out. Excellent. Well, I think that is the right note for us to end on. I want to thank both, both of our panelists. And it was a short time, but very powerful and important messages. Thank you very much. Thank you.